So um, you guys know the distinction between basic units and derived unit? Yes? Newton, is it a basic unit or derived unit? Derived unit, Newton is kilogram times meter per second squared. Uh, what about Joule? Derived unit, it's uh, you know, meter times Newton. Um, so having defined the kilogram, meter, and seconds, there are many other units you have seen that we can drive. You can drive Pascal, Newton per meter squared. But um, in the, S so it doesn't have to be this way, but we made this choice in SI unit system. There's one more unit that you have to define um, as a basic unit. Matthew? What, uh, what unit do we have to define as a basic unit? Because you cannot derive it from kilogram meters or seconds. I thought you were saying something. I, I didn't say anything. Oh, OK. <laughs> Never mind. So oh. column? Yeah, column. So that's the unit of electric charge you have seen in this class. So, um, so you know, once again, this is sort of a science of trivia. <laughs> so um, it's a, um, so let me write down a definition of column. Because there is no way um, there's no way to derive Coulomb from other basic units. But um, as I keep saying this uh, several times, um, to define every, all the physical quantities, you actually only need the three basic units. Coulomb is kind of, um, uh, it's not fundamentally necessary. But in the SI unit system, we made a choice to make this its own unit. So what we actually can do is, um, we can come up with a physical situation and use the physical situation to define Coulomb. So now, um, so what that means is we're, it's going to be based on measurement of force. So, um, so hypothetically, we could do it this way. Um, we could say, oh, I don't have, um, so we could say, you know, Coulomb is defined by, you know, amount of charge you have to put on these two point charges, separate them by one meter, and you know, then you should measure force of some number of newtons. That amount of charge is a coulomb. You could define it that way, but we don't do it that way. Anybody here have a sense of why? No, yes, no. Mm. Um, I guess, yeah, yeah, this is one of those things that until you have done a bunch of experiments, you, it's hard to get a feel of. Uh, it comes down to, it's uh, difficult to um, see how many charges I'm putting on an uh, object in a way that's independent of uh, the force it's exerting. It kind of becomes a circular. So, um, so, you know, you guys did the Van der Graaff generator lab, right? And the way you figured out how many coulombs were here was, or you know, on the pith ball, was you measure the force, essentially. So, um, so it's uh, independent to, in an experiment, it's, uh, um, so you, you know, when you're defining this unit, you have to try to think of a way, what is most feasible way of doing this. Not simply, what can you imagine up in your head? So, um, so in an, um, in an experiment involving electricity, it turns out what you can measure fairly easily is voltage. It's uh, what you see on this uh, power supply. It measures voltage and it measures uh, current. Those are the two things that can be measured precisely and be you know, established fairly well. So this is the way ampere is defined. So the way ampere is defined Sorry, I skipped a step. <laughs> this is the way Coulomb is defined. In the, in the SI unit system, they don't actually try to define Coulomb. The way they do it is they define Coulomb by, um, by defining ampere. How is ampere related to Coulomb? Anybody? What, what kind of quantity is Ampere describing? Coulombs yeah, Coulombs per second. It, this is one Coulomb per second. 
Ampere measures current, right? Yes? So current is measured in charge per second. So uh, Coulomb is defined implicitly by defining Ampere instead of Coulomb. And this is the physical situation that defines Ampere. The physical situation that defines Ampere is this. So, um, so you have two parallel wires. So I have a, um, two parallel wires. And let's say they are separated by one meter. Okay? And experimentally, you can cause a one ampere of current to flow. Oops, uh, I'm not drawing one correctly. Uh, you can cause one ampere of current to flow. And uh, let's say one ampere of current flowing on this other wire also. Then there is going to be a force between these two wires that are both carrying current. Why is there a force between two wires? Like if there was no current and I have two copper wires one meter apart from each other, should there be any force between them? No, there, I have net charge zero, so no electric force. There's no reason for there to be any force. So once the current flows, uh, why is there a force between them? So there's a magnetic field involved, but I don't really want to describe it in the sense of they are both generating magnetic field. Because you know, I look at what generates magnetic field, that's a current, and I want to look at what, uh, how is magnetic force exerted. Um, it doesn't, magnetic field does not exert a force on another magnetic field, because sort of field is a property of space. So, um, so what's the step you go through? So let's say this wire is generating magnetic field. How does that field exert a force on this wire? Is there an expression that we covered that actually we didn't write down there that describes the force uh, due to a magnetic? So you know, let, let's do a magnetic field first. Let's go through step by step. Um, so I'm looking at this wire one as generating the magnetic field. So. Uh, what's the direction of magnetic field due to this wire? Sort of goes around this uh, wire, right? So if I draw it in a perspective view, it would look something like this. Uh, oops, I'm drawing too many. Um, or you know, if I'm drawing in a side view, it would look like, all right, on this side, it's coming out of the board. On this side, it's going into the board, right? And you know, the magnitude is going to change depending on distance. Um, at the location of this wire here, there will be magnetic field coming out of the board, uh, sorry, going into the board due to this, um, due to this uh, uh, segment of, uh, due to this current. Okay, so why do this magnetic field um, or What's the equation that tells you how this magnetic field is exerting force on this current carrying wire? Anybody remember the formula? It's, a, um, it's a equivalent to this, but since I don't really have velocity or charge, um, it has to be rewritten in terms of quantities I do have access to here. Current and the length of the wire. So this was one of the expressions I wrote down earlier. Um, so for the cur so force, magnetic force on wire would be amount of current times L cross B. So the direction the wire's uh, current is flowing in, cross product with a B. And it can be derived from this. Your textbook doesn't read it if you're interested. But this is one of the formulas that's uh, useful to know. Um, so, so you know, it's this relationship that results in a force on this wire. Now, can someone tell me the direction of the force on this wire? Is it attractive or repulsive? Well, force between two wires. Is it attractive or repulsive? Huh? 
How many say attractive? How many say repulsive? Yeah. So this is where you have to be careful and go through the rules, right hand rule. So I know the direction of magnetic field here. So into the board. So I, it's into the board. So, oh, oh, I know. My hand shouldn't point in the direction of magnetic field. It should point in the direction of the wire. Yeah. So once again, you have to be careful with the right hand rule. It doesn't matter which uh, vector you point to first. So I'm going to make sure that my hand first points in the direction of current. And I orient it in a way that I can bend it in the direction of magnetic field. I, I L cross B, it's to the left. So the magnetic force on this wire is pointing to the left. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so that's the result you get. Um, there's a, when you have two current um, flowing in parallel, uh, going in parallel direction, there is going to be an attractive force on this wire. And um, so you get the result by applying these rules. Uh, if you were re remembering, you know, some of the rules that we were using earlier, you know, likes repel and opposites attract, don't use that with the magnetism. I mean, I know it works with the magnetic poles and whatnot, but as I keep saying, magnetism is complicated. Always go through the rules that you have been told until you develop enough familiarity that you know what the answer is before you do calculations. Um, so, all right, so there's going to be an attractive force. Now, uh, what if I changed my description around? Here, I said wire one generates magnetic field, and wire two feels that force. Um, it would uh, the, this answer here change if I switch it around? Say it's wire two that's generating the magnetic field, and it's wire one that's feeling the magnetic force. Would that change? Yeah, it should still feel attractive force. So we can go through it quickly. You know, current going here. So here, the magnetic field due to wire two is pointing out of the board, right? So making sure I do this correctly, IL cross B. So the force due to this magnetic force is still attractive. So, um, you know, I hope this is, uh, uh, um, this uh, reminds you of what we did with the Coulomb's law. So um, when we go through the device of field, it doesn't matter which of the two objects you say is generating the field and which one the field is acting on. And so all of this makes the whole, this whole situation consistent with the Newton's third law. This is the, let's say, action force, and this is the reaction force. Okay? So this is the situation, and I just want to go through uh, a calculation to look at um, how this ampere is defined and what the number looks like. So this is the number that I would want to calculate. What is the um, force between two, two wires carrying one ampere of current? So um, force between, um, uh, force between one and two. Um, if I simply say force, it's going to be infinite. Everyone here says why it's going to be infinite? You look at this relationship here, IL cross B. Is anything here infinite? Yeah, L. If it's an infinitely long wire, then it's going to be infinite. So I really say force between one and two per length. So let's say per one meter of length. So what we are going to calculate is, uh, is Newton per meter. It's so force density or whatever. I don't think that's the right word. So let's uh, just do the calculation. Um, so this is the formula I'm going to use. So what I need to write down is, so this is going to equal current I times length L cross B and uh, let's uh, simplify this a little bit. So, you know, L cross B, it's going to be L B sine theta. Anybody here know what the sine theta in this particular geometry will be? One, right? Theta is 90 degrees. The uh, current goes this way, magnetic field is 90 degrees to it. So, all right, so if we are looking at the magnitude, 
this is simply going to be current times the length times the magnetic field, which we derived over here. Okay? So let me write it down. Magnetic field will be mu naught over 2 pi, oops, mu naught i over 2 pi r. Uh, and for the per one meter of length, we are going to be dividing this by L. So it's a force per length that we are looking at. So L cancels out. I don't even have to plug in L, which is good. Um, so uh, let's just do work out an expression and just plug in all the numbers and see how much force we are talking about. Um, all of this sort of sounds like it's a standard amount of quantity, right? One ampere, it's not an excessively large or small amount of current. One meter, it's this much distance. I guess it's maybe a little bit too far. Uh, it's a, a farther away than usual side, but it's, you know, it's a, a amount of quantity that you can imagine. So um, let's see how much force we are talking about when we are dealing with that situation. So I have I squared mu naught. Okay, so let me write mu naught over two pi times I squared over R. And um, mu naught is actually one physical constant that I don't have to look up. I have it memorized. This is how I have it memorized. Mu naught is equal to 4 pi times 10 to minus 7 times of some units that uh, we are going to figure it out later. <laughs> so, so that's a mu naught. It, it's a, um, yeah, I, I just have it memorized. Um, so um, let's uh, plug in the numbers and see. So, and, and then in the process, we'll also figure out what this unit should be. So the, uh, so the numbers here is mu naught, or 4 pi times 10 to minus 7 times some unit, divided by 2 pi times current. We said it was 1 ampere. So 1 ampere squared divided by the distance. We said that, that was a meter, 1 meter. Oh, that seems like an easy thing to work out. Um, so let me work it out and write it down. This is equal to, um, so 2 pi cancels a lot of this. So I end up with a 2. 2 times 10 to minus 7, 1 squared divided by 1. So it's some um, um, so it's some unit of whatever this is times ampere squared per meter. Um, the units that we are looking at, what should this be equal to? What, what quantity are we calculating? Okay, it's related to force, but it's not just the force because we said if you're doing force, we would get infinite number. So what do we do to the force? Yeah, force per meter. So the unit here better end up being Newton per meter. So, oh, that gives us a uniform mu naught. So uniform mu naught is going to be, uh, I'm trying to stare at it and make the units come out right. It better be Newton per ampere squared, if I didn't make any mistakes. So this should be Newton per ampere squared. You know, I haven't done this before, so let's just to make sure that I didn't make any mistakes. This is how I would check that I didn't make a mistake. I'm going to look up what mu naught is on Ofram Alpha. Because Ofram Alpha, is, it's unit aware. It knows uh, units of different things. So the mu naught has two different names. One name you can use, use to call it is magnetic constant. Let me use the old fashioned term, permeability of free space. That's the old-fashioned term for mu naught. 
but a lot of people call it magnetic constant these days. So that's mu naught. Oh yeah, I was right. It's a Newton per ampere squared, and as I said, it's a, uh, when you work out this, it just should be four pi times 10 to minus whatever. Um, so all right, that's a mu naught. Um, so, so you know, in this, so this is how ampere is defined. It's defined this way. If you have two wires carrying one ampere of, or ampere is defined as, ampere is a such an amount of current that if two wires carry that amount of current and they are separated by one meter, then the force per length of the wire would be this much, 0 0.2 micronewton per meter. Does it sound like a lot of force? Well, it's a very tiny force. So that's why, uh, why you have seen me, when I do the magnetism demos, I have to put out as much current as I can. This has a maximum of three ampere, that's what I put out. And, and even then, all you have seen is this wire just to move a little bit. Um, so I think that's why a lot of people can have this impression that magnetism as a force is weaker than electric um, force. And to some degree, that's true, because it takes a lot of current to uh, get some significant amount of force. But what I want to tell you is that the magnetism and electricity, they are related. So the intrinsic strength of both of them are actually comparable. 